This is um, Creative Nonfiction Magazine. Um, True stories well told is what it says on top of creative nonfiction, and that's pretty much what creative nonfiction really is. Creative nonfiction is the fastest growing genre in the publishing industry right now. It's the fastest growing genre in the creative writing academic world as well. Fifteen years ago, I started the first MFA program in creative nonfiction at the University of Pittsburgh, and now there are more than 75 places in the United States where you can get a MFA degree in creative nonfiction, um, and four or five places, should you want to do it, where you can get a PhD in creative nonfiction. And uh, it is because in the 1960s and 1970s, people would say that the novel was king. Everybody was reading novels, but people are not reading that many big, serious literary novels anymore because the world has changed a great deal. There is so much more for us to learn and for us to know genetics and computers and, and robots and God knows so much for us to kind of take in and that's kind of come be a part of this world. And that's one of the reasons that creative nonfiction has become so important because creative nonfiction can teach people through story all kinds of things that they wouldn't necessarily want to know otherwise. Okay, so um, I have written a book about robots, but I don't just, it's called Almost Human, Making Robots Think, but I tell stories that enable people to connect with, with robots. And I put real people in, in my stories because we connect with real people. We're people, and readers always want to know how other characters exist. So that's creative nonfiction. And um, as I said, it's big in writing programs, but other movements have taken place. There is a narrative law movement. People like me are going into law schools and teaching attorneys how to present cases in a story-like form. There is a narrative science movement, um, and perhaps one of the biggest movements right now is narrative medicine. Almost every major medical school in the United States has at least one person teaching doctors how to write in this creative nonfiction form. For two reasons. One, because doctors need to learn how to communicate more clearly. And secondly, because, um, because here's the one thing about doctors that I know you'll, 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 you'll agree with me about. If a doctor has one major problem, it's that they may be incredibly skilled doing surgery, for example, um, or, or, talk, or, or making a diagnosis, for example. But here's their problem. Few doctors learn how to listen. And when you write a story, when you learn how to write a story, you have to listen to other people in order to write that story well. And that's kind of the idea behind narrative medicine. Columbia University has three full-time people, all physicians, teaching narrative medicine. Why is this happening? Well, because a lot of research has been done lately and uh, over the past four or five years since this world of creative nonfiction has exploded so well. And we have learned that people remember facts that are presented to them, many more facts, and for a much longer period of time when those facts are embedded inside a story. So if you want someone to know something and you tell them, you give them that information, they will lose a great deal of it. If, however, you embed that information in a real story with real people, they will remember it longer. Secondly, people are persuaded in a much more successful way, again, when that persuasive element with more facts, more information is presented in, in story. And thirdly, researchers have discovered that we, when we think about recreating our own life, 
our own histories. Um, we think we remember our life stories in chapters, in stories. We don't just say, I was born here, I went to school here. We say, oh, the first thing I remember is um, my mom's nervous breakdown or the day that I flunked freshman English, things like that. And so, again, the whole idea, if you want people to learn what it is you know, whether you're an engineer or a scientist, you, you try to do it in story. And so that's what creative nonfiction is all about. This is what I tried to do working at Arizona State University. Um, I'm the distinguished writer in residence there for a think tank group called the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes. And these are folks who are really interested, obviously, um, in science policy. And I got to tell you, they're some of the nicest people I ever met. But talk about wonks. I mean, talk about wonks. They talk to you in ways that they talk about really what really fascinates them. But they talk to you, all scientists, so many scientists talk to you in ways that, uh, that, the, that real people don't quite understand. And so the idea behind creative nonfiction, especially in the world of science, is to make it, this information palatable and interesting. And so um, I started um, one program that we call To Think, To Write, To Publish. And To Think, To Write, To Publish, which became a National Science Foundation uh, grant recipient, is that we brought together at Arizona State University uh, 12 science policy scholars and 12 young folks in the uh, big at the beginning of their life at the uh, beginning of their careers and 12 writers fiction writers and narrative nonfiction writers also at the beginning of their career and we brought them together in a collaboration so that the writers could help the scholars think in a more creative story oriented manner and so that the scholars could help the writers um, think more deeply about the issues and ideas that they needed to learn to present. And we formed collaborative teams, and we taught them how to write narrative, introducing some pretty, inter some pretty compelling writers, writers that I know you'll recognize, Oliver Sacks, Atul Gawande, um, Lawrence Krauss. Lawrence Krauss is a physicist. He wrote this really interesting book called um, The Physics of Star Trek. If you want to learn about star, if you want to learn, well, if you want to learn about physics, he tells you stories about physics in relation to all of the Star Trek's episode. He's not making up anything. This is the other thing that I want you to understand about creative nonfiction. And I'll turn to the first page here. You can't make stuff up. We are not making stories up, okay? These are real stories. I mean, science is all narrative. The things that we do are incredibly important, but we just have to take it out of the scientific mode and present it in ways that are more palatable. And so Lawrence Krauss um, does that. He kind of tells us what's possible and what is not possible in the whole world of physics, but through the Star Trek's characters. That's creative nonfiction. Most people do like I do. I'm a writer, and, and I immerse myself in subjects. And so most people do what I do. They try to do their research, but then make sure that they personalize it. And so good, good scientists who are also writers, they often write in the, pers in the first person. And they often tell you a little bit more about the process of research so that the reader can connect not just with the science, but with the person doing the science. And they also tell you a little bit about the people they're working with and what their laboratory is all about and how they even got the idea initially to do this kind of research and the struggle that they have had. They will even tell you, a good creative nonfiction writer might even tell you how it was when they grew up and got interested in science, all because they know that in order for them to get you to understand what it is they do, and it's really important these days that you understand what scientists and engineers do, there shouldn't be a wall between the lay public and science and scientists. 
because science is so important. We want our young people to become scientists. We want our parents to urge our children to become scientists. We want teachers to bring people who study English and people who study geography and history together with science. And again, the way you do that is by making it real, by turning it into a human experience through story. And so um, we had this collaborative venture, and so far there are five pieces that have already been written by um, our teams of scientists and writers. And um, there's a magazine, a journal called Issues in Science and Technology. It's published by the American Academy of Science. And um, they got so interested and so excited about these pieces that our collaborative things uh, wrote about that they began publishing them. New voices, new ideas. They have never published in all the years, 40 or 50 years since they have been publishing a piece of narrative nonfiction. But now three issues in a row they have published narrative nonfiction. People are becoming really interested. I watched someone on a train not too long ago take the New York Times. And you know the New York Times? The New York Times um, has all these sections. There's a business section, a sports section, and a home section, and a dining section. When I get my New York Times, I always toss off the dining section. I'm not, I don't care where I eat as long. Um, I, don't, I don't care that much about where to go in New York. I don't live in New York. But I watch people as they go through the paper and the science section. So many people throw away the science section. Because the way in which most newspapers present science is they make it interesting and palatable for the people who are interested in science. But what we need to do, and we need to do this through story, is to be able to make science interesting and compelling to people who aren't interested in science. To people who are interested in other people and other professions and other ideas and other ways of life. And so when you can take your science and turn it into a story by telling a little bit of your story along with the science, you're impacting a much larger audience. Take a look at the major magazines today in the United States. Two things are happening. Um, if you take two or three major magazines, I will name, say, The New Yorker and Esquire, fewer pieces of fiction are being published and many more pieces of nonfiction are being published, and increasingly of that nonfiction, more and more about health, medicine, science, and technology, increasing rapidly because that's what people want to know and that's what we need to teach the people who are trying to live in the 21st century. One of my books is called um, Many Sleepless Nights, The World of Organ Transplantation. I spent time in the operating room with surgeons. I jetted through the night in organ donor runs. I, I hung out with the nurses at the, in the transplant ward nurses station. I lived with the patients at an outpatient facility. I slept in the, in the, in the, in the transplant wards, in, the, in, in major hospitals, transplant center hospitals, all to kind of figure out what this world of organ transplantation was, was all about. But the book begins... The book begins with this kid, this 15-year-old kid named Richie Becker. And Richie Becker's dad has a sports car. And Richie Becker thinks that when he turns 16, his dad's going to give him a sports car. But three weeks before Richie turned 15, 16, his dad said he was selling the sports car. And Richie got really upset, didn't say anything to his dad. But that following day, that following day, he came home before his dad and mom got home. He went into the dad's room. He took the key to the car. He got in the car and he pulled it out, backed it out of the driveway onto the main street because he had promised his girlfriend from the absolute beginning that in three weeks they would have a car, this nifty red sports car to drive around in. The one thing I should tell you is um, Richie never drove any time in his life before that. Only watched his dad. He took it out to the highway and um, lost control of the car. It went over an embankment. And when his parents learned about Richie, he had been taken into Charlotte Memorial Hospital, and he was brain dead. Okay. It's an incredibly sad story. But, but that's how the book began. What I tried to do was, from that point on, 
explain exactly what had happened in the world of organ transplantation before that to get to that point when you have a young um, potential donor and and explain every single step along the way from from donation to the recipient's life after the donation. And I put in all of the science I could. You can learn step by step how to do a liver transplant or a heart transplant, but always there was this specter of Richie and his parents and and the heartbreak and the tragedy of the experience that was in the reader's mind. The readers wanted to find out what happened to Richie and they wanted to find out what happened to the recipients of Richie's organs at the same time. And people, people, many people read this book. This book was written um, almost uh, 15 years ago. It's still in print. It still kind of tells the story of organ transplantation from beginning to end, all the science, all the technology, without necessarily using any gobbledygook, any jargon at all, because it brings real people into the situation. And it's always one long story, like a, like a novel, okay? So it begins with some tragedy, with some exciting or sad event, and it ends that way. And this book ended when Richie Becker's parents, um, Richard Becker and uh, his new wife, um, came together with the two recipients of Richie's main organs. Richie gave a liver to uh, an 18-year-old girl who was dying with hepatitis, and Richie gave a heart and two lungs to a mother of four children who had uh, suffered with um, um, heart disease and lung disease for, um, for four years and was dying. And Richie's contributions saved both of these lives. I should say that it's been, as I said, 15 years. The liver transplant recipient is still alive, and um, the book ends when the recipient of the heart and the lung um, meet Richie Becker's dad, Richard Becker, for the first time after all that time to get the chance to thank them. And the last scene of the book is the last thing I saw um, was when we were leaving after spending the evening with the Becker family, um, Richie Be- Becker's dad got down on uh, his knees and put his ear up against the chest of um, this, this, this woman, this mom, um, who, 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 who had his son's heart and lungs. And he listened, he listened um, for the last time, obviously, to, um, to his son's heart and lungs beating inside this woman's chest. And so everything that you want to know about this subject is presented in a dramatic, real, true story. That's the challenge of creative nonfiction and the reward of creative nonfiction, especially in this world of science, is that people listen, people understand, people relate, and people connect. That's creative nonfiction. So this is, this is Creative Nonfiction, the magazine. I thank you very much for listening. I'm Lee Goodkind.